Good evening. I'm Dixie Anderson with the World Affairs Council. And welcome to this, our final Great Decisions lecture series of the season. So, bittersweet for us. We'd like to thank our sponsors this evening, Farnham Law. Um, Mr. Goodman, would you like to stand and be acknowledged? And the Center for Sustainability at Aquinas College, Dr. Deb Steckety, is here, who also is our moderator. And of course, we thank Michigan Radio, our media sponsor. Well, how many of you have achieved perfect attendance? I'm going to get my glasses on so I can see. How many were here for all eight? Wow, good, good. Okay, how many made six or seven? I, wonderful. Wonderful. Well done. Um, we hope you all enjoyed our new armchair discussion format. I think you have because we certainly have gotten a lot of positive response over it. So what I want to do tonight is give you all a great big thank you, and that's to you, our audience. Um, with this new format, we've, uh, the audience has had at least 25 minutes of discussion and Q&A. Uh, after every session, and I, I just think that's fabulous. So congratulate yourselves. Thank you. That's, that's wonderful. If you would like to stay updated on our events, uh, you can sign our email advising list out in the lobby, and we'll send you an email. Uh, you can join, and you'll also get discounted pricing. We do have a special $10 email membership. Again, that's out in the lobby, too. We have two events coming up uh, in this next month or so. Our first one will be debriefing Saudi Arabia with Dr. Roger Durham, who's over here, who just returned last week from Saudi Arabia. So we're going to do a briefing on it. Raj, wave your hand. I'm looking forward to that one. And then, uh, of course, uh, the first part of May, as our celebration uh, during World Trade Week, we'll also be doing our semi-famous international trivia game called World Quest. So we hope you'll consider coming to that. That's, that's great fun. We are going to continue with the armchair format again this evening. Dr. Bartis will make brief remarks, and then Dr. Deb Steckety, our moderator, will ask follow-up questions and then turn it over to you. So. Text your questions at any time. The number is in the uh, program. And of course, if you'd rather just come right down to the mics, don't be shy. Just come on down and ask your questions. Our moderator for tonight is Dr. Deb Steckety, who is a professor in the Sustainable Business Program at Aquinas College. Our speaker for this evening is Dr. James Bartis from the RAND Corporation. And I have to tell you, we bring in researchers from RAND as often as we can because they are all uniformly excellent. Um, a hallmark of RAND researchers is their commitment to present unbiased research to you. And incidentally, uh, Dr. Bartis has sent along the RAND review. Again, these are in the lobby if you'd like to pick one up. Feel free. So, I have too many sheets of paper here. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bardas for his presentation, Energy Geopolitics, an Issue of National Security. Dr. Bardas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you and, and Deb for the hospitality. Uh, that you've shown since I've arrived here. It's uh, my first time in Grand Rapids, and it's evidently a very nice city. Uh, I was on a plane on, on uh, Friday, a very long flight, and I had a copy of the uh, International Herald Tribune with me, and I was reading the, uh, the, the magazine to pass the time, and I noticed that there were a few articles that I thought were very current and important for the kind of topic I wanted to have today. So this is the uh, this is last Friday's issue that I'm going to be this very past Friday. So 
uh, what I've done on the next slide is I've, I've uh, uh, written down some of the headlines or, or, or topics as they appeared, exactly as they appeared in the, in the, uh, in, in the uh, Herald Tribune. And it's remarkable that in a little 20-page newspaper, uh, there are this many uh, relevant topics on energy or related. And uh, so let's uh, begin with uh, um, the topic I would like to spend a good portion of, of our discussion today on, namely, uh, the, uh, this was their front page article, uh, energy gains change the equation for U.S. leaders. And behind that article is the fact that we are, uh, uh, we are pumping more oil in the United States. Uh, we're getting more oil from Canada. And it, there's uh, some talk that uh, eventually uh, we're going to be much less uh, dependent on imports and that we ought to rethink our foreign policy. And that, this, that, um, that the only reason uh, that we have all these problems uh, in the Middle East, uh, may, the implication being that we have these problems in the Middle East because uh, it's imp important to our oil imports. So I th um, you know, quite frankly, I, I'm, I'm very concerned with, with that, uh, that the whole article and the gist of the article uh, on that topic. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later in the talk. The next uh, article was, uh, was titled, U.S. Allies Spared Iran, Iran uh, Oil Sanctions. And this one is really close to my heart. I've been looking at the geopolitical power of oil exporting nations for some, some 12 years now. Uh, back in uh, the early 2000s, uh, we were trying to pressure Japan not to make large investments in uh, Iran. Uh, the Azagadan oil fields were uh, uh, being offered, Japan was being offered the opportunity to invest in, the, in these oil fields. And we still had, at, our, at uh, the highest levels of our government, we had, had great reservations about uh, Japan's prospects there. And at the time, um, the message coming from Japan is, well, you know, we are your good friend, but, you know, we're also our own country, and this is very much, we need to have this, this oil. We need to put our flag on Iranian oil. Well, it turns out that, they, uh, that the situation in Iran got so bad that even the Japanese realized that they could not invest there. But here's another example of, you know, one more example of the fact that we can't, that, that oil exporters really do have some power in the fact that we cannot move fairly strong allies of ours to get off uh, uh, or to, to move away from Iran. And the same power is held by Venezuela, for example. Uh, even though their oil exports, and nor, nor are Iran's oil exports that much uh, compared to their population. Iran's a population of about 70 million people. They export about 2.4 million barrels. You do the math, it's not that much money per person. But that money doesn't go to the people, it goes to the government. Uh, the, third, uh, the third one was uh, an editorial uh, entitled, The Oil Under Our Noses. And the bottom line of that editorial was, we need uh, to drill much more in the United States because uh, there are great benefits, uh, national security benefits, if we drill more in our own country. Uh, and that goes sort of like reinforces the, the headline um, you know, if we are energy independent or oil independent um, or close to independent, uh, does that really change our security? Uh, the fourth uh, bullet there is uh, concerns the number two, uh, actually they're almost tied with Iran, I mean Saudi Arabia. Uh, both Saudi Arabia and, and Russia produce over uh, 10 million barrels a day of oil. So this is a very important energy country. They're not a member of OPEC, so we don't hear as much about them, but they're very important on the energy scene. It's interesting that uh, uh, the situation in Russia, they have lots and lots of commodities, but they've put all their effort behind oil because oil is bringing in cash flow. And again, that cash flow doesn't go to the people, it goes to the government. So it allows the government of Russia to have uh, uh, its way without asking for taxes. The uh, 
Uh, and, and this article raises another issue about energy uh, efficiency. And the Russians are notorious, as were many of the Europe, uh, Eastern European satellite nations of, in, of, uh, of the former Soviet Union with regard to the, their lack of efficiency uh, across the board. And it's certainly still there in energy in Russia. And efficiency is important to us. Same paper. And it's a real paper. I mean, it's right here. Uh, same paper. I uh, had uh, three more articles. Uh, that I wanted to, to share with you. Uh, the, the, the next article is, uh, talks about a carbon plan could pay off for airlines. Uh, we're talking about when the carbon plan is global warming, an extremely important issue. Uh, if we didn't have a global warming problem, we probably wouldn't have an energy problem because we've got lots of oil in the world and lots of coal in the world. Uh, but because of global warming, uh, we have a, a big challenge ahead of us. But this is a strange article because it's, it's talking about how airlines can make profit by, by, by some scheme being put forth by the European Union. And it's true, they can. A lot of companies, uh, there are certain things you can do uh, with regard to uh, carbon taxes, and we can talk about them later if there are questions, but there are certain schemes that you can come up with so that companies benefit, they book this benefit as part of their, their uh, uh, total equity, and then uh, pass, pass the, the savings that they made into costs to their customers without any net benefit in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but that doesn't mean greenhouse gas emissions are not important to address. The next article was about nuclear reactors. And although uh, uh, this, one was, this one concerned the fact that uh, some of the companies, because of the low interest rates and the poor performance of Wall Street, some of the companies that own nuclear reactors don't have as much money in their cleanup funds uh, when these reactors retire as they had hoped to have. But uh, more to the point in, in terms of, of my interest in bringing it to your attention is there is that nuclear component and nuclear waste component uh, uh, to energy and nuclear proliferation, as we are uh, uh, seeing with Iran. And finally, uh, this isn't oil, but it's pretty close to oil. You heard last week or a couple of weeks ago, the president announced that uh, we're going to take China uh, uh, to the WTO. We and our allies, the European Union, are going to take China to the WTO about rare earths. And I don't want to get into the details about this particular rare earth refinery. It really is all about people don't want it in their backyard. And, that's common. This happens to be, in, I think, in Malaysia, but it's also common here. But um, I just finished a study on, on uh, critical materials, and, and I'd like to share a little bit of that with you uh, today. Even though it's not oil, it's very similar to oil. And so there's a lot in common. So let's uh, 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 move on a little bit uh, back to that very first, uh, that very first uh, comment there about energy gains uh, change uh, the equation for, for, for the United States. And, um, and this, this set of, uh, of, uh, of columns shows the mix of U.S. energy of oil. This is about liquid fuels. Okay? And the blue, uh, the blue, and the years are 2000, uh, 1998, 2005, and January of 2012. So I got two year averages, and then the last one is January 2012. But what happens? What January 2012 is just showing an upward trend. So I'm not, I'm not playing game. I hope I'm not playing games with you on the data. In the blue, there is uh, well the total the total size is total U.S. Uh, consumption of liquid fuels. Okay, so that shows what we use. And you can see that in 1998, it was a little bit higher than today. Today is on, on the right. And, and then it went up pretty high from 1998. It really started growing. By 2005, it was uh, over uh, 20,000 barrels a day. And, uh, and if you look at the mix, the white 
represent, well, the blue represents what we produce in our own country. The red is what we get from Canada. And the orange is what we get from Mexico. So you can think of US, Canada, Mexico, pretty secure supplies. And the white represents what we get from the rest of the world. Nigeria, Venezuela, primarily Nigeria, Venezuela, a little bit from, from uh, the Persian Gulf, not too much. And you can see that there's been a fundamental change over the last seven years, from 2005, uh, when price, well, first, the reason I put 1998, by the way, 1998 oil was $10 a barrel. Okay, it's about 100 and something a barrel today. And 2005 was just as it started going up in price. So you can see that those low oil prices sort of encouraged a lot of, a lot of uh, consumption. And you can see that we were pretty dependent on, on foreign oil. Okay, we were making less than half of our oil. And you can see how fundamentally different the situation is today. We're pumping more oil from the United States within our own country. We're getting more from Canada because of the tar, tar sands or oil sands. If you're, if you're from Alberta, you call it oil sands. If you're from the environmental community, you call it tar sands. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Mexico, because of its governance problems, Mexico's production has gone down. It doesn't mean the oil is not in Mexico. It means that Mexico has severe governance problems that prevent investment in oil. So it looks like there's a pretty, uh, a, a pretty good, good story here. I mean, this is, I guess, good, this is good news. Uh, it means to me... Um, that markets respond to higher prices by lowering demand, and it means that suppliers respond to higher prices by producing more oil. And the reason it didn't happen as oil prices went up in 2005, or when they peaked in 2008, is because once you decide in the oil business that you're going to look for more oil, it takes at least 10 years before you get that oil out of the ground. So it's different from, say, agricultural commodities that have a very short cycle response time. In the oil world, it's a very long response time. And that's why there's so much volatility in oil. It's also on the, on the consumption side. Once you've bought your SUV, even if you sell it and buy a small car, someone else has bought it and they're driving it. Cars stay on the road a long time. So there's a, there's a long response time on both sides. When you have a long response time on supply and demand, the only thing that can really influence and make those two quantities come together is going to be price. And that's why you get the price volatility in oil. There's some speculation that goes on there too, but that's part of the way markets work. We could probably do a better job of controlling it, but that's, I'm not an expert on that. Well, the next slide, uh, uh, I... I I put uh, the next slide is devoted to what is the meaning of of, of energy security because I feel there's um, the there's a trend that in the U.S. to to believe that energy security is energy independence. In the previous slide that I showed you, uh, is this the beginning? Is this the beginning of a trend? And if we keep on going will we get to the point where that white disappears so that North America will be energy or oil independent? And most recently, the National Petroleum Council, which uh, is a, an industry, oil industry advisory group to the uh, Secretary of Energy, they have done a study that shows that by 2030 or 2035, we can be energy independent if we just open up more of our federal lands and our offshore areas and uh, the Arctic, uh, the North Co uh, Shore of Alaska to production. So energy independence is, is, is presumed to have some value. So to, to, to discuss what value energy independence has, I thought it would be useful to think about what energy security means. 
So that's what this slide is all about. It's, it's um, uh, a slide I've used a number of times, especially when I'm talking to officers in, the, uh, in our military. Um, and that's one of the things we do at RAND. Um, and we, we, we explained that there are three components to energy security. There's an economic component, and that economic component manifests itself as, as elevated prices because we have a cartel out there, and we have lots of national oil companies in the world. So we have elevated prices, and we have huge wealth transfers. Huge amounts of money leave our country and go to... Uh, the members of OPEC. And they leave other countries. They go to the members of OPEC. And, and by the way, huge wealth transfers uh, 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 occur between oil users in the U.S. and, and uh, the fairly uh, moderate-sized companies, a whole bunch of them, that produce those 10 million barrels a day. I mean, 10 million, million barrels a day times $100 a barrel uh, we're talking. We're talking a lot of money per day. I mean, that's a uh, uh, billion dollars a day. So there's uh, three hundred and roughly three hundred and sixty billion dollars moving from from one part of America to another part of America. And the same on top of that, there's all the money that's moving from from our shores to other shores. And I guess it's better to move it within America, but you know. From your own pocketbook, it's, uh, it's it's hard to tell the difference, right? If you want to say what what does the oil bill mean per household? It's about four thousand dollars today. It's about four thousand dollars a year per household is what we pay for the crude oil we buy. So if oil were were fifty dollars a barrel, we would have an additional two thousand dollars to spend on other things. That's a lot of money. I mean, when you think about the average household income of the United States, it may not be what, you, what yours is, but the average household income of the United States is, you know, what, 40000 something like that. So it's a good fraction of average household income. So there's an economic component. Uh, the price volatility hurts the ability of our businessmen to do their planning and anyone who uses oil to plan ahead. There's a security uh, component to... Uh, to energy security, and, uh, and one component is about reliable supplies. But you know, since since we now have an international oil market, reliable supplies are reflective, uh, reflected into higher, much higher prices. And then, and uh, so I don't think reliable supplies is, is really a, a big issue anymore. Uh, it's really about money, and uh, uh, part of the security component, however, which I mentioned earlier, was these geopolitical power shifts. Those who have oil, those who sell oil, they have political power on the international scene, and they use that power. The, uh, and then finally, there's the environmental component. And, if, and the environmental component manifests itself not only in local and regional issues, but as we mentioned earlier, in, in global uh, climate change and, the, and the, the prospects for that. And if you took away any of those, tr any of those three you know, any two we could solve. It's the problem is well, trying to figure out a path that addresses all three together. And uh, so in light of, this is what energy security is all about. What does energy independence have to do with energy security? Because if we don't, if we don't uh, import any oil, when we import it only from Canada, it means that instead of sending the wealth to um, a part of our wealth to, to say, Saudi Arabia or, or Venezuela, we're going to be sending part of our wealth to the oil patch gang in the U.S. It's still a wealth transfer. I mean, it's not as if the price of oil isn't going to be reflective of the world market. The Canadians are not going to sell us oil at a discount compared to what they could get it on the world market. Nor will our own companies. I mean, they'll scream bloody murder if, they, if we try to force them to sell them. And we shouldn't. I mean, we should let the oil, oil price be priced internationally. So, so energy independence isn't, isn't a, uh, doesn't offer too much from that perspective. From a national security perspective, the implication is, well, we wouldn't be 
fighting in the Persian Gulf if we if we uh, didn't if we were not getting oil from from the Persian Gulf and uh, you know it's hard to believe that I mean we're not in Iran Iraq for any rational reason that has it, well for any rational reason and certainly not for oil and and where uh, and with regard to Afghanistan I think it was they don't even have oil. So, so you, you know, it's, it's questionable that our defense budget come, would come down if uh, we simply did not import oil from the Middle East. Because, you know, we, have, we're, we live in a world that's connected. And, and uh, so, what, so what's my, my, uh, my theory about why is everyone telling us that, uh, that uh, domestic production is important? And that en that energy independence is important, and I think it's on this slide that that tells us this. This slide shows uh, uh, it's, this graph shows um, that that forty seven percent of oil reserves are off limits to private companies across the globe. In other words, there are countries that say you don't you can't touch it. Mexico is an example. No private company can come into Mexico and pump their oil. It has to be done by their national company. Then in that red or orange uh, wedge, it shows about 37% of the world's oil reserves are in countries that will let you come in, but they're going to bargain hard. And an example of this would be Qatar. Okay, sometimes Saudi Arabia lets a, country, a company in. But for the most part, it's through their own company. Now, that doesn't mean you can't play as a service industry, but no one wants to be a service industry in oil. They want an equity. They want part of the equity action. So what's left? What's left is the 15% of the world's reserves in which you can be an equity owner. You can own it. And nearly all of those reserves are in North America. So if you're a private company, you want to have the action here in North America. And that's why there's so much emphasis and misinformation about the importance of allowing them access to our oil. Our, our oil in the US, oil in Canada. And uh, I'm not only do I not think it's it's that beneficial. I mean, it's good that we pump oil where oil can be pumped. I just worry that that our very easy, the very easy access we give these companies, actually, you know, we charge them an extremely low royalty rate. I mean, nobody anywhere else in the world except Canada would allow these oil companies this kind of extremely low royalty rate. And so what it does is it's going to be depleting our oil before the rest of the world depletes its oil. And that's sort of the situation that happened in the 60s when we put, in, we put a, an embargo almost on imports to protect Texas. We, we prematurely depleted tax, our oil, our own nation, nation's oil. So I, I, I wonder if it's not in our best interest to actually make it that when companies want to have access to oil on public U.S. lands that we, we charge them a somewhat higher royalty fee uh, for our own longer term uh, security. So this is, I think, what's driving uh, what I'll call is you know, the party line uh, of its, its energy independence is so important. It's really an excuse to, to drill, 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 baby drill, is that the phrase? Um, but, you know, we do have a, a complicated geopolitical situation when it comes to oil. And uh, this is a chart I prepared for a study that's going to be coming out very shortly by Rand, uh, authored by me. And this chart shows um, the uh, all nations in the, in the year 2009, every single nation that had, ex that had net exports of over 200,000 barrels a day. So remember, the world uses 87 million barrels a day. So we're talking about some pretty small exporters here, but also the big ones are on there. And what we did is uh, we don't is 
at RAN is, is we split them up into groups. And the first group is the OPEC, what we call at RAN, the OPEC core. Because we don't think OPEC is a cohesive organization. We think OPEC is Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, and, and Kuwait. And everyone else is, is there for the free ride. I mean, uh, Iran needs all the money it can get. Venezuela needs all the money it can get. The fact that they're not pumping more oil in Venezuela and Iran is due to governance problems. And right now, it's also due to our, our sanctions. But in Venezuela, for example, it's due to governance problems. So I've, I've shown the OPEC core in the uh, dark blue. And at the other extreme, that's, so that's the cartel power. They're the ones who are deliberately not producing to keep prices high. Uh, but they don't want to go too high. They're not foolish. They don't want to go too high. But uh, they've not, as, as you may be aware, they, they haven't been very effective over the last, over, since their existence. They can be effective for a little bit of time. If they go too high, then the market comes in and, and oil prices crash. The next, the next group are the light blues, and those are what we describe as, as market-responsive drillers. And there is only three on the list of market-responsive drillers in the world that export. One is Canada, one is Norway, and the other one is Oman. And Norway's a little, you know, whether Norway's in that category or not is sort of up in the air. But uh, uh, so, so what's the rest? The rest of the world is either places that have ongoing conflicts, or at least had conflicts when this chart was made. And I think, and you'll see that, you know, Iraq, Libya, Nigeria, Sudan, who else is on the list? I think that's it. So we have a one, two, three, four, four, four major com countries that have ongoing conflicts that, that is stifling their own production. Nigeria is at least two million barrels below it would, what it would be if it were still a crazy country but didn't have conflict. Okay? And it has a huge amount of oil. I mean, what they recently found, as you may know, that we recently found a huge amount of oil off the coast of Brazil. It's called the pre-salt. It's deep, but it's huge. Well, guess what they're finding off the coast of Nigeria and, and uh, uh, Ghana and its neighbors? Pre-salt oil. Remember when Africa and South America were, were, were tied right there? It's the same source. It's amazing. I mean, it's, one, it's probably the, one of the few geological facts I know is about the continents being put. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, I mean, huge amounts of this um, that they think is there. It's not been fully developed, and it's not going to be cheap because you've got to go deep. Um, Iran, Iraq, has a massive amount of oil. You know, number three in reserves, may, number two, number three, there's an argument who, how big they are in the world. Huge amount compared to us. I mean, we produce 10 million barrels a day on one-tenth of their reserves. If this war, if peace ever comes to that poor country, can you they're going to need money. They're going to want to pump. The oil minister has already said, we're going 12 million barrels a day. That's our goal. I mean, right now, they're producing less than two. What happens when this oil gets on the market? What happens to OPEC when this oil gets on the market? And all the other countries that I have in mustard or whatever that color is, uh, those are countries, we look at the World Bank list of governance indicators, and every, all those countries are in the bottom 25%, some are in the bottom 10% of you know, corruption, lack of the rule of law. Uh, we deal a lot with Russia. We run a, at RAND, we run a, a, an oligarchs forum. I mean, it's unbelievable what we have to go through to deal with Russia. Uh, I mean, there's so much corruption in that country. Um, so, uh, but you can see that, you know, the oil world is not a simple world. I mean, there's a lot of problems with the oil supply chain. And depending on this oil supply chain are countries that are very important to us, uh, either as our allies or because they're emerging powers. For example, 
75% of the oil from, that goes through the Straits of Hormuz goes to Asia, to Japan, our very close ally, Korea, and other Asian countries that we're very friendly with, and a lot of it goes to China. So we have energy independence. We walk away from the Persian Gulf. We say, okay, it's going to China, you're in charge. Do we really want that? I mean, it would be nice if we could do this in a multinational, multilateral way, worry about those sea lanes and promote peace. But I don't think we're walking away from this. So to sort of sum up, because I only have a few minutes, I, may, I don't know if I'd gone over time, because I don't have a, am I okay? Uh, I thought I'd talk about energy strategy for, for uh, in, this, in, what I, in light of what I've just said. And, and you know, to be honest, um, uh, I've been doing this for a lot of decades. Um, and I'm sort of disappointed with how little progress we've made when it comes to having an effective energy strategy. We have an energy strategy today, and it's basically, let's pump more. And there's a debate between those who care about, who care more about the environment, who have a very strong conservation ethic. There's a debate about who gets access to what. But it's basically, let's pump more. And then it's, it's moderated by what the environmental consequences or the land use consequences are. And, uh, and the big issue there is who gets, who, whose values get prominent. So if you use energy independence, you can say, well, the, the drill baby, drill can gets more. Um, and a lot of, of course, uh, as you know, there's some, there's some pretty, so a lot of the land in Alaska in the West is owned by the government, so it's driven by offshore land is controlled by the government, so it's driven by land access, and it's driven to some degree, not too much, by a lot of subsidies that oil and coal companies get, but they're not that big. I, uh, uh, the President Obama has said that he wants to uh, uh, get rid of the subsidies, um, which is, I think, a good move, uh, but it's not... It's not going to change things too much. The, the, second, the second component of U.S. energy strategy, and this has been going on for a long time, it's not unique to the Obama administration, is the government selects the technologies. It sort of selects the winners. When George Bush was president, uh, the winner was hydrogen. We're going to have a hydrogen economy. And they put a lot of money into Detroit on building cars that would operate on hydrogen and fuel cells. Uh, with, when President Obama came in, he decided we're going to have the electric car. It's, it's sort of like bureaucrats, you know, picking technologies. And, uh, and uh, the third component of the current, I think, the current uh, energy strategy of our nation is a hope for technical breakthroughs. And I'm a big advocate of research, but, you know, I think when you're in the research world, you've got to be realistic about the timing of investment. So when I joined the energy department as a mere child in 1978, uh, photovoltaics were five years away. And they're still five years away, I mean, in terms of, you know, without subsidy. Uh, I think they're longer than five years away. I think, you know, I think we need to put a lot more money into photovoltaic research. I mean, algae is another area where I think there's a big potential benefit. But the benefit is not in in showing that I can fly an airplane using an algae-derived fuel, the benefit is associated with, which I pay $400 a gallon for, which is what your government is doing, but the benefit is getting the price of that fuel down to you know, $3, $4, $5 a gallon. That, that's the breakthrough, and that's what we want, and that takes a lot of research. The, uh, uh, so there's this, you know, fusion was 25 years away in 1978. I was on a fusion panel now it's 50 years. Uh, uh, that's, so it's, it's sort of an unrealistic uh, hope, uh, for, you know, a naive hope. I mean, Congress wants things right away, so the people, the research community in the Department of, of Energy can't tell Congress, well, I need to have a good 15-year R&D program. I mean, they'll be thrown out the door. So it's always five years from today, I'll have this great new breakthrough. Uh, and I think a better approach, in fact, not only do I think it, but I think most of my colleagues who have spent their careers 
in energy, and certainly those at RAND, would be a technology neutral approach in which we get rid of, uh, of the subsidies and uh, uh, across the board and put in, put in mechanisms, broad-based mechanisms, that value the externalities, the environmental externalities, the global warming externalities, uh, uh, and, and the, input, the fact that the externality associated with being dependent on a cartel, which we've been able to price uh, through our, uh, the work we do at RAND. Uh, and, and, and that way, you let the business community come up with the most cost-effective options. And if that's photovoltaics, it's photovoltaic. If it's wind, it's wind. But you don't have someone in Washington picking you know, batteries or, or, or whatever. You, you let the market decide what is cheapest within your framework, within this broad-based framework. And when I testify before Congress, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I can see their eyes glaze over when I, when I, when I say that. Uh, one of the things uh, that we're doing at RAND is we're pushing uh, uh, information out the door about the importance, if we can't get people to address global warming, at least we can drop the subsidy on automobiles. Right now, the gas, the national gas tax doesn't pay, and the state gas taxes for the most part do not pay for what it costs to keep our highway infrastructure in shape. So highway, basically the general tax fund is paying for our roads, is basically subsidizing the use of cars. So we're saying at a minimum, at least get the people who want to drive to pay for what it costs to drive. That just makes sense. And there's lots of ways to do that. And, and one way is simply raising the gas tax. It's probably the simpler way. What we're seeing in Virginia is we're seeing a lot of toll roads going up. And, uh, and uh, you know, middle of the beltway roads so that the wealthy can take the fast route and those who are less wealthy will be going slowly. The, uh, I mean, those, those toll, these are, we, we just sold the middle part of our beltway and it's almost, the project's almost done. We sold the middle part of our beltway to an Australian company that's going to pay, charge quite a few dollars to, to be in their fast lanes. Uh, and that's because politicians don't want to raise the, the gas tax. Another uh, important uh, item to add would be the import premium that I mentioned earlier. It comes to about 25 cents a gallon. It's not, not going to break the bank, but uh, you know, during an election year or any other year, is any politician going to say, I want to raise to put a tax on gas? Um, and finally, uh, carbon fees. I didn't talk much about global warming uh, I'm not an expert in that area. I am very familiar with all the policy alternatives. Uh, we think that some kind of carbon fee has to be put in there, not just for gasoline, but all energy we use. And then you let the, let the private sector pick the, pick the most economic cost. So in, I'm going to shift gears very quickly because I just finished a study on critical materials. And you know, when I, I mentioned about oil having a real impact on households. On, on, and wealth transfers. Well, on, on critical materials, and the, the one you hear about is rare earths, we, we use so little, or tungsten, we use so little of tungsten or rare earths that if the price of tungsten went up by a factor of 10, you and I wouldn't know it happened. Because it's, you know, even though it's in every incandescent bulb, and it's, it's actually in something much more important, which I'll talk about soon, it's a small fraction. So when it comes to oil, our big concern is wealth transfers. And of course, wealth transfers mean investment and savings don't occur here. So we don't build up our capital stock. So we are hurt when it comes to things like manufacturing and own US ownership of companies. But when it comes to critical materials, what we found is something far more subtle. And the first thing we found was, you hear a lot about rare earths. There are about, I don't know, eight of them. I'm a chemist by training. I forgot them, how many there are. But there, there are about eight or so rare earths, or maybe a few more. Uh, but it's not just rare earths. And what we show in this chart is that China controls a huge amount of the global production of a number of very important materials. And 97 or 98 percent of all the rare earths in the world are mined in China today. 
92% of all the antimony is mined in China. Every plastic that has anything to do with a piece of electronics, the antimony is there as the fire retardant. All cable has got antimony in it for the fire retardant so they don't catch, the plastic doesn't catch on fire. Uh, tungsten. Uh, why is tungsten important? Because the number one use of tungsten in the United States is in cemented carbides. Uh, I didn't know what a cemented carbide was a few months ago. Cemented carbides are the sharp parts of all cutting tools. So if you go into a manufacturing plant in the United States that's cutting metal or cutting anything else, all the tubes are going to be coated with tungsten carbide. Drill bits have tungsten carbide. I'm talking about the lathes, everything, the robot, the robotic cutters in a factory, okay? Tungsten carbide. So I went to tungsten carbide made of people who, who make those cutting tools in the United States. I went to a few companies that make those cutting tools. And I said, what's going on? How do you feel about this? He said, we've been told that in 2015, they said, not one, 2015, we can't count on what we're getting today from China. But the Chinese have made us a deal. If we open a factory in China, we can get all we want. Second, we found out that there's two prices for tungsten. There's a price when China sells it to our firms, and there's a second price when China sells it to their firms. That's against WTO rules. Okay? It's not just, so it's not just rare earths. So what they're, what they're doing, and now, now if this tungsten carbide cutting firm builds a, if the, if the tungsten carbide business, that's just one business component of tungsten, moves to China, and an American manufacturer has a problem on his assembly line, what he does today is he calls that company up, and they send a tech rep over and say, okay, how do we change it? Well, if it's in China, they're going to have to call the Chinese guy up. And then they're going to come into their assembly line. So you're going to have the Chinese firm rep looking at your assembly. That's just not going to happen. So if we care about manufacturing, we have to care that we have access to these minerals. Um, graphite, germanium, uh, indium, uh, uh, vanadium. Vanadium, it's only 37%. China only controls 37% of the market. Saudi Arabia only controls 15% of the oil market. And they control the market. These are way above. I mean, if, they, if these were American companies, they, they would be broken up. And you can't, you know, and to think that you can go to China and say, oh, be nice to me, as I go into Rockefeller before they broke up Standard Oil and say, oh, be nice. All right? So we have, I, I, and it's really China. I mean, there's a couple of important things that Russia has. There's a, uh, South Africa has a, a lock on platinum and chromium, but they're, you know, they're pretty responsive to the marketplace. Uh, Chile is uh, very responsive. Brazil's got uh, the lock on niobium. It's just it's geography. Um, and the Congo has, uh, which is a very unstable place, has a, has, a, has a big piece of the cobalt market. But what really comes out is, is that this one country that is centralized, has a centralized government, centralized planning, that doesn't think in terms of just the mine and the mine owner and how I optimize his profit, but thinking of Chinese industry more broadly and you know, it's, it's all centralized. And we're dealing with that kind of country. So it suggests to me that we as a nation have to accept this new reality that this is not gonna change overnight and start much more aggressively enforcing and coming, bringing to bear uh, 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 the fact that you know we we make we are their market, and so we have power here, and so does the WTO, and we have to I believe we have to be much more aggressive with the WTO if we want to uh, preserve manufacturing. So that's the uh, those those are my remarks, and I'll be very pleased to take just about any question. Dr. Bartis, why don't we move over to the okay. comfortable spot there. And uh, in the interest of time, we're just going to open the questions right up to the audience. And so please make your way to one of the microphones here 
or to um, the texting number that you found in your program, and we're happy to, to get started. Does somebody have a pressing question? I've got a little list, just like I do in my classrooms, in case the students are very quiet. So come on down and, and get that first question answered. Hi, I'm curious as to what Rand thinks about the depletion of materials. Because certainly, as time has gone by, a lot of the easy to get oil, for example, has changed significantly the geopolitical setup. What kind of stuff is Rand looking at in that for the future? We, I mean, my own, my own view is, is that we're far from depletion. And, um, and that's why I think it's so important that we engage in, in, in addressing global warming uh, because of, of our concern about that phenomenon and the damage it might, hap it might, it might do. Uh, my own view is, is that there's enough oil in the world to uh, toast the atmosphere three times over and, and uh, that we really uh, um, need to take, governments have to act. It's not, geology isn't going to give us the signal that we're running out of oil. We're not, not but, running uh, out of oil, but running out of easy Access, not oh, just think, to oil, well, but to other materials. I think in, in, uh, outside of, of a few countries, there's still a lot of easy oil in the world, but, but we don't have easy access to it. So it, we, it does cost more to get oil. I mean, but you know, our oil company, even though the price of oil is $100 a barrel today, uh, our oil companies don't look for $100 oil. I mean, they're getting oil out for much less. But you're right. I mean, the, the very easy oil, the oil that you just, you know, so we're going deeper, we're going to more extreme environments, and, uh, and technology is doing a tremendous amount. I mean, just three years ago, or four years ago, uh, we thought we had about 30 years of natural gas, and now because of uh, horizontal drilling and fracking sort of coming together, uh, we now have over, we think we have over 100 years of natural gas, and especially, well, contingent upon resolving some environmental issues. Um, in thinking about your slide with the three circles yes. and um, American interests, protecting American interests, um, and, and you were talking about independence alone is not going to uh, protect our interests. And so I was thinking that you were talking um, on the slide previous to that, that white section about uh, local The white reserves. section was what we imported. What we make ourselves. No. It was okay. So, so the section that we make ourselves, that has been going up as a proportion of what we consume. And no, you were, no. Uh, the section we, yeah, the section we make ourselves is getting bigger and bigger. Right. Which is a good, you know, not bad. So I was thinking, um, it, I was wondering if you could comment on um, the nature of uh, energy companies being multinational and um, how that actually protects our interests if the companies are, for instance, British Petroleum, who is a multinational company who's getting oil from our area. Yes, I mean, we allow British Petroleum to come in and drill in our, our waters and in our, uh, in our uh, federal lands or anywhere else. I mean, we're, an open, we're open to competition. Um, that's an interesting question. And in fact, um, we were talking about that exact question. What is the benefit of having a uh, American-owned or American-based big international oil companies? And uh, I don't know. It's a good question. It's a real. I mean, I mean, I, I'm really when I interact with Exxon Mobil, I am really impressed with the quality of that company. And, you know, they hire Americans and they, you know, they hire everybody from around the world, but, you know, Americans have a big role in that company and it's an opportunity for Americans to play. Most importantly, they probably are far more environmentally con uh, conscientious than a lot of these small mom and pop oil companies. So, you know, because they have deep pockets, they have a reputation, um, you know, they don't play, I mean, it's a, it's, it's an outstanding, and, and so is Chevron. I mean, we have two 
Conoco Phillips. We have three. I mean, very, very good American oil companies. We also have a lot of American companies that you've never heard of that are out there drilling oil all over the world and, and you know, off the coast of Africa. And there's a lot of entrepreneurship and coming out of, the, out of this country in oil. But I don't know, you know, their profits come back, sometimes they come back here, uh, not always, uh, because of our tax laws or whatever, but good question. I wish, I wish someone would uh, pay us to uh, <laughs> look into it. <laughs> and it can't be them. <laughs> Hi, uh, today there was an excellent article in the Wall Street Journal about um, natural gas and uh, energy infrastructure of the United States. And there, there's a commentary there in there who talked about the fracking and horizontal drilling being a black swan event and how you can use natural gas now as a substitute for oil if you wanted to go to a um, transportation uh, infrastructure dependent on natural gas. And with, you know, yeah, I'm looking at your critical materials here and you know, have you contemplated any black swan scenarios where we could discover m the capability of mining the seabed for rare earth minerals? All right. Uh, with with reg there, a lot of what's drive. I mean, natural. You know, this fracking, this hydro fracking uh, technology is really very new, and a lot of what. And I don't know how much cheaper it's going to get. I mean, generally, as you do more and more of something, you learn more and things, the price goes even lower and lower. On the other hand, um, a lot of localities where this is going on are, say, are saying, well, wait a minute, we want you to put more money into environmental protection. A lot of the, uh, of the consumers, I mean, a lot of the, of the landowners feel that they didn't get the right deal. Um, you know, I mean, an oil company comes in and makes it, you know, they've got all the lawyers and, you know, you're sitting over your kitchen table. So uh, I think, you know, some of this, this still has to be, be filtered, you know, has, has to uh, settle out. But, uh, and a lot of what's going on, especially in the Marcellus, is due to the liquids that come with the natural gas. So they're really, the liquids sell for a fortune. I mean, the liquids are ethane and butane and propane. And they sell for a lot of money. They're very valuable. And there's a very high fraction in the Marcellus of these liquids, which count as petroleum in the, in the mix and sell at the price of petroleum, if not higher. And so the natural gas is coming off as a byproduct of really liquids because, you know, a lot of... Uh, so, we'll, I mean, we'll see how it all turns out there. Uh, with regard to... to uh, uh, the, you know, the rare earths in tungsten, you know, the, the, the research community is looking at substitutes for these materials, but some of them are very, uh, and we're also looking at recycling. I mean, a lot of the tungsten that we use in the United States is recycled tungsten. The, you know, that, but some of it you just can't get. You know, that machine that chops up the road, that's all tungsten, car, those are those cemented carbides are on that machine. The tungsten, you know, you can't collect that because it's gone. <laughs> But we're pushing recycling. The industry is out there doing the recycling. The price of rare earths went up by a factor of 100. I mean, oil went up by a factor of, what, five, and we all, you know, and seven, I guess, when it was at its worst, when we all, you know, were, this is 100. Tungsten went up by a factor of three. So all these increased prices are promoting new mines, uh, better technology that uses less of it, nano, the nanotechnology uh, advances are coming in here. So the market responds. But just like oil, it takes 10 years to open a new mine. <laughs> so you're sort of stuck with where you are. We are trying to open that mine in California. It was, we had a mine. And, and some of the stuff we're seeing that China's doing, you know, is due to the fact that, you know, as China's getting richer, they're recognizing that they need to have better environmental and health and safety controls. I mean, you know, in 1910, I think 10,000 U.S. miners died in the mines. And uh, so, you know, we've, we've progressed a lot in the last 100 years. And, you know, they're a little bit beyond where we were in 1910, but not much in terms of safety. Thank you. I hope that answered. Yes. Yeah. 
We have another question. Hi. Uh, last year, the IMF was warning that high energy prices were going to undermine economic recovery. European Union, United States slap Iran with sanctions. Oil speculators say tensions in the Middle East, tensions in the Middle East. Here we are at $4 gas. Oil's buck 20. How come that conversation isn't going on now? Either the Obama administration really gambled with sanctioning Iran, or there's some underlying economic recovery that says that the global economy can handle this kind of an oil shock, to use the phrase. Um, it's not just Iran. I mean, when, when we had the, the $140 a barrel oil, we had problems in Venezuela, we had problems going on in Nigeria, so you know, we had a hurricane or something. Uh, we had some problems in our own Gulf. So it's, it's this, you know, it's when a bunch of things come together, it's really bad. So we've just had Libya, we've got Sudan right now, which is not producing because they're, the two parts of Sudan are arguing. Uh, um, the Nigeria is still not anywhere near its production. Iran, Iraq is better. It's getting up there, but nowhere near its limits. Uh, Iran puts out about uh, 2.4 million barrels a day, or until recently did. I don't know what's going on now. And uh, if you take 2.4 million barrels off the market overnight, you're going to see the price of oil go up pretty fast. I don't know where it would settle out because it's such a crazy market. Um, we have, between us, we have 750 million barrels of oil in our strategic petroleum reserve. Our allies have a similar amount of oil. So, uh, you know, during the first Iraq war, George Bush Sr. did convince our allies and ourselves to simultaneously have a release. It, it greatly pushed the price of oil down. Um, I can imagine that Iran, if there were more than sanctions, if we went into a combat situation, which I hope we don't get into, um, um, the, uh, I can imagine that they might do something about the Straits of Hormuz, and, but I don't think that they would be shut for that long. Um, yeah, I ran, there's a number of, uh, of reports that we've done on, on Iran, and uh, the gist of most of those reports is, is that there's a lot of dissent within Iran, and that you're just gonna let the Iranians work it out and be patient. And, uh, but there, a number of our allies, not just Israel, I mean, there's a number of, you know, Saudi Arabia and all the countries in that region uh, are very worried that uh, a nuclear-armed Iran uh, would be a problem. The interesting thing is, is that uh, Iran has all the legal right to do what it's doing. So, uh, so, I mean, under the non-proliferation treaty, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, they have the right to do all these things. And so they take great umbrage with us uh, suggesting that uh, they, sh they shouldn't have that, be able to do this. On the other hand, we say to them, look, you've got all the gas, you're the biggest gas producing country or the second biggest in the world. It's cheap, well, nuclear power is not cheap. Why, uh, why are you trying to develop uh, a nuclear power capability? And, um, so there's good reasons to think that they are, but you know, to date, they, they've been, it's, it's a, you know, they've taken great umbrage with our, uh, our, our position. Got another question here. The, the uh, commodities markets around the world, uh, by way of speculators, are supposed to hedge the markets so we get less and less uh, fluctuation. For instance, Hershey gets, uh, uh, their chocolate and the price of chocolate goes up, we don't pay another $10 for a, a candy <coughs> bar. How come that is not working uh, with the, the oil prices? Is it algorithms in the trading, uh, mathematical, or is it psychological trading? Or are, are the markets reacting to, uh, I can get mine and uh, screw everybody else? I, 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 you know, a lot of the hedging that we see is what we call physical hedging. 
I mean, the chocolate market, you know, someone's got the chocolate in a warehouse, all right? And, and in the oil markets, a lot of it is, 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 it's just financial hedging. It's sort of, you know, I'll, let's place our bets. Um, we, we have not looked at RAN, we have not looked at this hedging issue in, in depth. I mean, my, econom my colleagues with the PhDs in economics uh, agree with you that this is an important component of any market is the ability to hedge. Speculators have a very important role in, in stabilizing markets and, and protecting uh, both sides, uh, the suppliers and the, and the users. So speculation works both ways. I mean, speculators can lose money and they can make money. Yeah. When China and Vietnam went to war many years ago, the gold market went crazy. Right. And um, there was no connection uh, really in, in the gold distribution, manufacture, and, and consumption in that war uh, there. Yeah. Do you think the same psychological thing is happening today in, I think, in terms I th of oil? I think, I think speculation is not, I mean, I think our markets, I mean, our commodity markets especially, are highly reactive. It's sort of like they, 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 they overreact. I mean, I, I even see this on Wall Street, I feel. Something small happens, and for some reason, the day it's announced, the market really strongly reacts, and then the next day it does a correction. And, and but not I, I, back down to where it was. Well, not necessarily, but I, 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 there is something in, in oil, and I don't know what it is. I mean, there is, I mean, there is, a, there is an element uh, that where speculation is keeping prices higher than they are. But you know, the speculation only goes so far. I mean, the, 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 the groups that are most upset about this are actually you know, Saudi Arabia and the oil exporting countries because they're selling at one price. And, and uh, the speculators are putting it up here. And, and it's due to you know, the, the worry about deliveries with Libya and the worries about when, when Libya was unstable. And Libya is still not where it was. It's still considerably less than it was. And also, uh, you know, this current Iranian concern. Uh, but there's only so many ships. I mean, if the price goes high enough, you know, the rest of the world starts selling. There's only so many uh, tanker hulls to store the oil in. So at some time, the, the speculators blow. I mean, they. They can't just, they just can't keep it up. For time tonight, this will be the last questions and they were um, sent by text from the audience. Um, I won't have time to ask all of them, but two in particular have asked about um, either government or maybe private investment and effort in one oil shales and then photovolactics like you were talking about earlier. Well, I'm glad you asked me about, oh, now oil shale means what? what? What, do you mean the oil that's in Colorado or do you mean tight oil? Because everyone gets those two mixed up. Colorado, <laughs> thank you. Well, I mean, uh, oil shale in Colorado I have deeply studied and uh, uh, there's no need for government investment in technology because we have outstanding companies like Exxon and ConocoPhillips and Chevron and others who are deeply engaged in technology. And Shell and uh, uh, the, uh, Petrobras from Brazil that are paying with their own money uh, for technology uh, associated with developing that. And the U.S. government has made uh, uh, plots of land available in that shoil, oil shale area. Um, and uh, so uh, that from a technology, so that they can actually go and, and apply their technology at a uh, small scale. Uh, oil shale is very imp a huge resource for the United States. I mean, we have uh, the, the total resource is somewhere be that we think is extractable is between uh, about 500 um, billion and 1.1 trillion barrels. And sort of the midpoint of that is about three times the reserves of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the problem with oil shale is that this vast amount of oil 
uh, is uh, in this, most of it is in this little part of Colorado. The best stuff is in Colorado in something called the uh, Piance Basin, if you say it politely. And, uh, and uh, it's about 600 feet underground. And uh, under a single acre of land, there's about 2.5 million barrels of oil. There's no place in the world that has more, more energy under an acre than in, uh, in this place in Colorado. Now, I use the word oil. It's called oil shale. It's actually a solid. It's, it's teenage oil. It's not yet formed. It takes a few more million years to, to make it, get it out of the ground. Uh, I mean, to make it into a liquid naturally. So the game that Exxon and Shell and Chevron are looking at is, I'm going to heat the ground up. I'm going to go 600 feet deep or 400 feet deep, heat up the ground, and within, and I got to heat the ground up uh, to about seven, 600 degrees Fahrenheit. 700 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot. I mean, water boils at 212. Up in Canada, they do 180 degrees Fahrenheit to get the oil sands out. So you got to heat it up to this fairly high temperature. It doesn't take, it, when they told me this, I thought they were crazy. And I did the calculation. It doesn't take that much energy to heat it. And then it, when they heat it, this process accelerates and so that within a few years, it all comes out. And uh, it's exciting. Uh, it's really high tech. The problem is uh, it sits in the Colorado River Basin. All the oil shale is commingled with salt. Um, if you want to have a real industry, uh, you want to be able to be producing millions. The goal of the U.S. is to produce millions of barrels a day from this little area. That would, that's, you know, that would be nice. But you don't want the first plant to come in, put out so much pollution, or mess up, do so much damage environmentally. So I think the need for government, re uh, so that, the, the, that you can't have big development. So I think the, the need for the government is to do environmental research, infrastructure, start thinking about this. Because right now, uh, this area has no monetary value to us. Uh, there's a lot of pressure from some politicals in, in, in Congress uh, and in some groups, some pressure groups, that we should immediately lease this land. And if we lease it now, it'll go, it, 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 won't, it won't draw any value. A single lease track of this land has about a trillion dollars worth of oil, but it's only gonna be monetized if, it's, if it has value. Photovoltaics, government research ought to be directed to me at advanced concepts that offer to make electricity at one third the price that current technology does. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Bardis, you've given me a whole different way of looking at this issue. I, um, I, our discussion tonight, uh, I don't know how the rest of you feel, but just um, um, very comprehensive and uh, uh, I think we, you've all given us a, a lot to think about, so thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Steckety, thank you very much for your help this evening. We appreciate it, and, and throughout um, for getting us uh, through the, the topic as, uh, as we did. And thank you to all of you for coming uh, for our, our last uh, session, and also we're very happy that Amy, our uh, program administrator's baby, decided to wait until after Great Decisions was done. It's been touch and go, and thank you, baby. So um, thank you all. We are adjourned. <laughs>